Welcome. I'm Terry Ann DeAnker, a Dominican sister of Adrian. On behalf of our Leadership Council, it is my pleasure to invite you into a Dominican conversation on conscience. Our focus on this topic was prompted by the concern of leadership that all of us have a chance to review and renew our understanding of our own informed conscience in the light of the many moral issues confronting us today. Our Dominican tradition calls us to a stance of listening deeply to all sides and speaking our truth. Whether it is in response to the CDF's assessment of LCWR or other pressing questions. What is our relationship with the church and church teaching? How do we make decisions in light of church teaching? Not just about religious life, but about all the issues that touch our lives daily. And how have we come to the belief, as expressed by the LCWR in its August response to the assessment, that religious life, quote, as it is lived by the women religious who comprise LCWR, is an authentic expression of this life that must not be compromised, end quote. Each of these questions involves the exercise of conscience. Are we exercising our conscience in ways that are faithful to church teachings? How, to begin with, do we form conscience? In consultation with the Dominican leadership teams, we assembled this panel today to begin a conversation among us about the exercise and formation of conscience. Our panelists are Annalise Sinnott, a Dominican sister of Adrian, who will give some history of conscience formation before and since Vatican II. Lucy Vasquez, a Dominican sister of St. Catherine de Ricci, who will tell us what canon law does and does not say about conscience and dissent. And Sister Arlene Flaherty, a Dominican sister of Blauvelt, who will talk about her lived experience of exercising conscience. Their brief presentations cannot possibly capture what could be said or nuanced about conscience formation but they will invite us to further study of and reflection on this important human process in the context of the issues facing us today as Dominican women. For a long period in church history, from the Council of Trent until the mid 20th century, the church had projected an understanding of that truth about God and the things of God was like a table with one leg. The church and its magisterial teaching on which everything else in our faith life depended. The Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes, however, gave us a new mandate for the pursuit of truth. Instead of the one-legged table, magisterium only, we now had four legs on which we should depend for truth. The magisterium of the church, which includes many types of documents that can originate in any of the official offices of the church. The truth that emerges from the world around us. The long tradition of the Christian community and our individual consciences formed through our own prayer, reflection, and experience. Over the last 50 years, we have been about the task of growing in our understanding of what is truth and living out of our developed consciences. By now, we should be comfortable with the place to which we have come. But in recent years, that which we claim as truth seems sometimes to come into conflict with the stance taken by the official church. We find ourselves wondering when and how we can dissent from the official church stance on certain issues. And is that a valid decision for a good Catholic? There are many official church teachings that might help us with this dilemma. I'll mention just a few. 
What does the church teach about conscience? Gaudium et Spes, Article 16, proclaimed, quote, deep within their consciences, men and women discover a law which they have not laid upon themselves and which they must obey. Its voice, ever calling them to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil, tells them inwardly at the right moment, do this, shun that, for they have in their hearts a law inscribed by God. In the commentary on the documents of Vatican II, Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, commenting on this passage from Gaudium et Spes, wrote this, quote, over the Pope, as the expression of the binding claim of ecclesiastical authority, there still stands one's own conscience, which must be obeyed before all else. If necessary, even against the requirement of ecclesiastical authority. Conscience confronts the individual with the supreme and ultimate tribunal, and one which in the last resort is beyond the claim of external social groups, even of the official church." End of quote. Following our consciences, then, is not just an option. It is the way God has called us to live out our lives. But Gaudium et Spes also insists that we have an obligation to form our consciences. And so we ask, how have we formed our consciences? And how do we continue to do this? The truth that we hold deep within our consciences has been shaped by our experience, by the unique lens through which we have encountered the world. But there are other influences, too, that help to shape the truth which we hold. Our exposure to systems of dominance, such as racism, classism, and sexism, have helped us to uncover the root causes of untruth. Most of us recognize that our search for truth re requires compassion, openness to pain and anger, and constant conversion because we belong to the privileged of the world. Our responses to those to whom and with whom we minister do not always fit into the neat categories defined by official church teaching. And what about current magisterial teaching? How are we to approach official church statements? The process by which the church arrives at magisterial teaching usually involves these steps. In this fast changing world, new questions arise out of the experience of people that affect their lives. These new questions are studied and discussed by the experts. For example, theologians, scientists, historians, etc. in the light of all the other troop, truth already available. After much serious discussion on the part of the professionals, church leadership may consider it the time to issue an authoritative statement to guide the majority of church membership in their decisions. Following the issuing of an authoritative statement, traditionally has come a period of conversation and dialogue with the larger church that leads either to reception, acceptance of that particular teaching, or rejection, non-acceptance. The doctrine of the church is found in many forms, encyclicals, doctrinal statements, liturgical free forms, etc. It can be issued from any level of the church hierarchy, and our magisterial teaching in the church has emerged over the entire 2,000 years of history. As Catholics, we have committed ourselves to know the church's tradition to give it the benefit of the doubt and to follow it to the best of our ability. But it may happen that after careful thought, prayer, and consultation with experts, we might disagree with some particular articulation of a teaching. What do we do then? In November 1968, the American bishops issued a pastoral letter entitled 
human life in our day, in which they affirmed the doctrine of dissent under three conditions. The reasons are serious and well-founded. The manner of dissent does not impugn the teaching authority of the church, and the dissent does not give scandal. In spite of these traditions, the official church seems to be, on certain issues, moving back to the model of the one-legged table. Many of the problems which people grapple with today, immigration, life in all its stages, poverty, fair wages, war, sexuality and sexual identity, are also often the dividing issues in our church. Amid these tensions in the church today, we ask, where is truth? Is there truth on all sides of the division? What is the truth to which we as Dominicans are called? And how do we responsibly hold to that truth? Gaudium et Spes reminds us that it is only in freedom that people can turn themselves toward what is good. Even the most cursory look at the Code of Canon Law will establish rather quickly that Canon Law does not concern itself with conscience. Still, I believe that the law of the church has something to offer us as we consider not only the ever-emerging situation dealing with the doctrinal assessment of the LCWR, but the larger question of how we respond to matters of faith and morals based on both our baptismal vocation and our religious profession. The closing canon of the code, Canon 1752, states that in observing canonical prescription, we should do so, quote, having before our eyes the salvation of souls, which is always the supreme law of the church, end of quote. Thus, we should always remember that when all is said and done, when 1,752 canons have been written, when prescriptions, prohibitions, policies, and principles have been expounded, the supreme law of the church is and will always remain the salvation of all. When in doubt, the code seems to say, that is the supreme law so that anything that stands in its way is necessarily subordinate to it and is to be set aside in favor of it. So one could say that one of the purposes of canon law is to provide structures that will support the best possible practices in order to promote as far as possible both the individual and the common good, or put another way, that will promote the growth and holiness of the people of God, which the code calls the salvation of souls. While the code does not specifically refer to conscience or to intellectual dissent, in the section on the obligations and rights of the Christian faithful of the baptized, it does offer a number of directives concerning intellectual pursuit dealing with matters of faith. Canon 218 says that those, quote, who are engaged in the sacred disciplines enjoy a lawful freedom of inquiry and of prudently expressing their opinions on matters in which they have expertise, while observing due respect for the magisterium of the church, end of quote. Respect, not agreement. The third paragraph of Canon 212 also states, quote, in accord with the knowledge competence and preeminence which they possess, they, the Christian faithful, the baptized, have a right and even at times a duty to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinion in matters which pertain to the good of the church, which pertain to the growth and holiness of the people of God. And the canon continues, and they have a right to make their opinion known to the other Christian faithful. End of quote. 
Please note that neither canon speaks of any of this being done with blind obedience. As a matter of fact, that whole section of canons never mentions that any of this is to be done with blind obedience. I believe that these canons are significant when considered in conjunction with Canon 1752 and its statement regarding the supreme law of the church, and they are equally significant when one considers the difference between speaking to the church and speaking for the church. As all of us well know, there have been differing, even diametrically opposed theological opinions and approaches to most issues through the centuries. Numerous theologians were condemned only to be later exonerated, usually centuries later. Every one of them was speaking to the church. The role of the magisterium, on the other hand, has been to speak for the church. And in my opinion, herein lies the conflict. It often takes centuries to come to a point where those who speak for the church understand and agree with those who have spoken to it. Nevertheless, we still have a right, and as the canons say, even a duty within our own field of expertise, within our own chosen vocation, within our own Dominican tradition, grounded in an informed conscience and rooted in the rights that are ours through baptism to speak to the church. And that right and duty only gains significance when one considers the prophetic nature of religious life. What about the situation with the doctrinal assessment of the LCWR? The LCWR has pledged to make every attempt to dialogue with church officials in order to reach an acceptable solution. It is clear that the member congregations want to do everything in their power to reach a resolution. That having been said, the LCWR has also made it very clear that it will not compromise its mission or its integrity in order to do so. In an ideal world, it may be that all the issues will be resolved amicably. In a real world, it could be that the Vatican will decide to impose a restructuring of the LCWR. Should that happen, each member congregation will have to determine whether it can remain in the conference or withdraw and form some other type of union. Always remembering that canon law does not mandate membership in such a conference, but merely states that institutes may belong if they find it useful in promoting their mission. Beyond this, we would also need to remember that withdrawing membership cannot be penalized canonically because canon law does not mandate institutes to belong. Many questions lie ahead regarding not only the doctrinal assessment, but many of the other issues that we face. I believe that the prophetic charism of our Dominican vocation challenges us to face him with integrity and courage and to preach the truth, the truth that is so central to who we are as Dominicans, as we have come to understand it through our study and reflection, whether in season or out of season. Regardless of our particular experience of conscience, I'm sure we can all agree that our conscience has been developing over the years alongside of our emotional and physical, intellectual, and spiritual aspects of our lives. Conscience has a dynamic quality to it. Bernard Haring, the late 20th century moral theologian, stressed this point when reminding us of just how dangerous it is to consider the moral life as static. As a child, I was taught and subsequently thought of my conscience as an inner alarm that would go off warning me, be careful, treading on thin ice here. 
And I remember the nuns telling me that my guardian angel would whisper to me the right thing to do. You know, in hindsight, I think my guardian angel must have been in the witness protection program because it seemed when I needed her most, she could not be seen or heard. As an adult, however, I've come to understand conscience more as the process through which I sift and discern decisions with others in order to promote the best possible good in what are increasingly complex and nuanced situations that I encounter every day in my life. I consider my conscience to be both an endowment and a capacity I have to make moral decisions. As an endowment, conscience is part of me, shaped by a number of forces. My Catholic religious tradition, my family, my culture, my life experiences, gender, intellect, study, and the communities to which I belong. My prayer, my self-understanding, and consciousness, that is my awareness of my participation in an evolutionary and expanding life process, also shapes my conscience. As a capacity, conscience gives me agency or an ability to make responsible choices. In my experience, particularly shaped by my formation as a vowed woman religious, exercising responsible choices involves personal as well as communal discernment. In her book, The Evolution of a Vow, Obedience as a Decision Making in Communion, our Dominican sister, Judy Schaefer, reflects poignantly about how integral communal discernment is in the life of a vowed religious. Judy writes, obedience in communion is a process that seeks to listen to the various voices of one's moral perspective clearly, and then discern the echo of consonants with self, others, and the divine. Neither autonomy nor conformity can be goals in conscience decisions. The integrity of our conscience requires dialogue and discernment. The area of dialogue and discernment, of course, is precisely where women religious and an increasingly large number of Catholics are experiencing impasse with Vatican leaders. In the struggle, we need to be clear that the criterion of dialogue and discernment is essential to the mutual search for truth, the search for God. Without it, community is reduced to authority and conscience to conformity. As women of the church, our consciences over the past 40 years have been sensitized by feminism, our proximity to poverty, and other contexts of marginalization and violence. If anything, feminism has provided us with analytical tools to see, understand, and address systemic injustices. Realizing that the patriarchal worldview is pervasive within and among us all, we've been challenging ourselves to personal and communal conversion in order to align ourselves more closely with Jesus' life and his vision for our lives, the kingdom of God. Our relationships with persons who are poor and marginalized, as well as with planet Earth, requires of our consciences that we discern what is moral within highly complex and nuanced contexts. If some women religious are perceived by the Vatican as not sufficiently absolute in their moral assessments of abortion, same-sex marriage, or contraception, it is not because of feminism or their adoption of some form of political correctness. Rather, it's probably because of their encounters with God abiding with women who have had to make difficult decisions about their pregnancy with gay couples seeking to give God thanks for the gift of love, or with couples who know they must use a contraceptive so as to better provide for the children they have or to better provide for a child in the future. Addressing the complex context of moral decision-making today, feminist moral theologian Sister Anne Patrick writes in her book, Liberating Conscience, absolutism is theologically problematic 
because all values are relative to God and is morally problematic because of the effect it has on the common good. Discoveries in science as well as technology continue to broaden our understanding of the processes and dynamics inherent in creation. Similarly, our understanding of what it means to be human is continuously evolving. New understandings require discerned moral choices. This is not a time for our Catholic Church to ignore new knowledge and dismiss new questions. As church, we are not called to assess new knowledge with a medieval mindset or a patriarchal paradigm. Rather, we're called to study and discern new knowledge, emerging movements, and the disclosures of God within them. Certainly, an informed conscience requires this. As Dominican ecclesial women, our order's tradition of seeking and preaching truth through communal discernment and identifying and transforming contemporary manifestations of the heresy of dualism have impacted our conscience formation and focused our Dominican mission. As we know from our order's history, Dominicans discerning truth and dismantling the injustices of dualism have placed the order at odds with church and civil society, often at the same time. Is this not one of these times? Is this not a moment for Dominicans today to summon the transforming grace of our charism? In the tradition of Dominic, Catherine, Montesinos, and our founders and foundresses, should we not be calling our church and society today to respond meaningfully to this present moment in the ever coming kingdom of God? Thank you all for your presentations today. We know they were necessarily concise, but they were very informative. And they will help us get the conversation started. And thanks to each of you who have participated today by watching and listening to this preaching.